So here's our very last bit. Fortunately, quasars are a little bit easier to understand than dark energy. Uh, we need to know what quasars are. We need to be able to calculate their magnitude. Um, that's their absolute magnitude. And we need to be able to explain a little bit about why they're interesting in, in terms of uh, cosmology and the way the universe has evolved. So we need to start off with what they are. It's yet another very unhelpful name. Uh, they're called quasars because it's short for quasi-stellar radio source. Uh, which might give you the idea that quasi-stellar means it's a bit like a star, but actually it's not a star. And radio source might give you the idea it's just giving off radio waves. Well, that's how they were first detected, but in fact they might give off all sorts of radiation. Um, things that we need to know about in their very distance, they've, they've got a redshift of Z is greater than 1 in general, although we'll see there's a few exceptions to that. That tells, you, that tells us that they're a long, long way away, which, again, if you're getting the ideas here, means they're a long, long way back in time. Okay, Z is greater than 1 means a redshift. Um, more than 1, they're moving away from us, uh, what, what appears to be faster than the speed of light, but this is to do with the fact that it's close to the speed of light and their relativistic effects that we don't have to worry about, fortunately, um, govern the value of the Z number. Okay, they're very, very bright, so they're bright as an entire galaxy, Okay, and the way um, what it's thought is happening is when a galaxy is force first formed, it's formed around a black hole. So right in the middle here is a black hole. Um, some material will be going at the right speed to go in orbit around the black hole, but some material due to gravitational effects and such like at the centre will end up going the wrong speed. It will go too slow and it will fall into the supermassive black hole at the centre. Um, releasing huge amounts of energy as it accelerates towards the middle that will make it release energy um, so quasars are thought to be the centers of very early galaxies this is not happening in the milky way now because anything that was going to form fall into the black hole at the center of the milky way will already have fall, fallen in many billions of years ago so this is what the milky way galaxy might have looked like in its very early uh, formation when the centre of it wasn't quite stable and things weren't in orbit correctly, they were falling into the black hole in the middle. Um, so they're a handy use for us to do a bit of revision of things that we learned earlier in the unit. So here's an example of a quasar. This is a very um, unusual quasar because it's not that far away from us. Um, well, not, not a long way away from us in astrophysics terms anyway. It's got an apparent magnitude of 12.8 makes it the brightest quasar in the night sky and it's got a redshift of 0.158 that means it's traveling away from the earth at 0.158 times the speed of light we're going to use the hubble constant of 65 because that's what's on your data sheet and calculate its absolute magnitude so how do we do that well uh, the first thing that we need to work out is the distance so remember a redshift really tells us the distance if we've got the hubble constant so we start off from this um, value for the velocity. We need to turn that into uh, meters and then kilometers per second. So 0.158 times the speed of light gives us 4.74 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Um, and then from the distance we can turn this, notice I've turned this from meters here, 10 to the 7 into kilometers, 10 to the 4. So if we rearrange v equals h over d we get the d equals uh, v over h. So here's its velocity, turn that into kilometers per second, divide it by 65, the Hubble constant. It tells us it's 729. Don't forget that the units here tell us kilometers per second per megaparsec, so 729 megaparsecs away. Now we've got an apparent magnitude and we've got a distance. That's enough to give us the absolute magnitude. So we need our m minus m equals 5 log d over 10 equation. Rearrange that, we get m, big M, the absolute magnitude, is little m, the apparent magnitude, minus 5 log d over 10. Here's our d. So you just plug those numbers into the calculator. Remember, this distance has to be in parsecs, so we've got to turn our megaparsecs into parsecs. Uh, and you just plug the numbers in, you get minus 26.5. To comment on the answer there, that's roughly the same as the apparent magnitude of the sun. So think carefully about what that means. This means its absolute magnitude how bright it would appear from uh, a distance of 10 parsecs away, that's 31 light years away, would look the same as the sun looks from where it actually is. So the sun at its distance 
would look the same brightness as this quasar, not that this would be possible to do, but if you could put that quasar 10 parsecs away, it would look the same brightness as the sun. Hopefully that gives you an idea for how bright it is, but we can do a calculation to actually get us a number for that. So um, comparing brightnesses, remember this is an inverse square law, so the brightness um, goes down as the square of the distance. So the brightness of the sun divided by the distance to the sun squared must be the same as the brightness of um, our quasar divided by the distance of that squared. Well, here's our distance to the sun in meters. Here's the distance to the quasar um, turned into meters with our conversion factor there, 3.1 times 10 to the 16 meters in a parsec. If we just uh, cross multiply there to rearrange that, we get this expression here for the relative brightness of the quasar compared with the sun. If you put the numbers in the calculation, you end up with 4 times 10 to the 12. So what that tells us is that this quasar is 4 million million times brighter than the sun. Okay, This is interesting to us because it tells us about the early universe when um, galaxies were still forming and that most, most uh, quasars are in the distant parts of the universe which means that they're in the early stages of the formation of the universe. And that was used to partly disprove the steady state theory because the steady state theory would say that even if these galaxies were being produced, they'd be produced throughout space and not in the far distant parts, which we're saying are the younger parts of the universe. Okay. Um, also, you do occasionally get quasars. So you might be thinking that I've been saying that they're at the edge of the universe, but we did a calculation on one that was only 0.158 times the edge of the universe away. But you can actually get new quasars formed, and that's because sometimes gal galaxies collide with each other, and when they collide, you can get material, um, new material that's formed into the hole at the center, the black hole at the center. So when Andromeda and the Milky Way collide in a few billion years, okay, we might end up being part of a quasar with immense amounts of energy being produced as stuff falls into the black holes in the middle of these two galaxies.